Hi everybody. Just before we begin, I want to play a quick promo for the podcast Crimes of the Centuries, which is a podcast which examines some of the biggest crimes in history. Sometimes a case comes along that is so heinous, so shocking, that it's called the crime of the century. Truth is, though, there have been a lot of those cases over the years. I'm Amber Hunt, an award-winning journalist and author, with a new podcast that marries true crime with history. It's called Crimes of the Centuries from the Obsessed Network. I'm examining stories that left a mark. Some of them are first of their kind, like the country's first recorded murder trial or first kidnapping for ransom. Crimes of the Centuries will explore not just the crimes that were committed, but what was happening in the world at that time and what effects they had on society that we may still notice today. Subscribe to Crimes of the Centuries from the Obsessed Network on Apple Podcasts or wherever else you get your shows. Now, back to the podcast. In terms of the death toll, 1972 was by far the worst year of the Troubles in Northern Ireland. 476 people lost their lives, and over half of that number was civilians. It was also the year where the IRA staged their largest ever day of bombings. In the space of 80 minutes, the IRA detonated 22 bombs in and around Belfast, turning the city into a war zone. This is the story of Bloody Friday. This is the Troubles podcast, a podcast which explores the violence and bloodshed that occurred in Northern Ireland, the Republic of Ireland and Great Britain, as multiple sides and organisations waged a conflict over the status of Northern Ireland. In the first months of 1972, one of the most prominent incidents in the Troubles occurred, Bloody Sunday. We covered this in season one, but it saw members of the British Army shooting dead 14 civilians, This attack, as well as the introduction of internment, led to a huge uptick with nationalists joining the IRA. For those who may not have been here for season one, internment was the mass arrest and internment of people suspected of being involved with the Irish Republican Army, but many of which that were scooped up ended up having little to no involvement with the IRA. Bombings and shootings suddenly became a daily occurrence, as the entire country slipped into chaos. So much so that by March, Northern Ireland's government and parliament were dissolved by the British government and direct rule from England was introduced. The car bomb is something that has become synonymous with paramilitary activity in Northern Ireland. It is a lethal and extremely potent method of waging war. Cars can hold a large amount of bombs and they are also hard to identify in busy cities. Once they go off, the glass and metal that make up the car become deadly pieces of shrapnel that cause even more amounts of damage. The IRA first started using car bombs in 1972, and the first car bomb is widely considered to have taken place during the Donegal Street bombing in March, which killed seven people. Then, in April, the IRA exploded 24 bombs in towns and cities across Northern Ireland. They were clearly ramping up their activity, as were the British Army and Loyalist paramilitaries. In late June 1972, the IRA had agreed to a ceasefire while they were engaged in secret talks with the British government. The IRA demanded a British withdrawal from Ireland by 1975, as well as the release of a number of IRA prisoners. These requests were impossible and talks broke down. Then, just two days later, the IRA engaged in a gun battle with the British Army in Lenadoon. The ceasefire was officially over. The IRA wanted to stage a show of force and to cause financial harm on the streets of Belfast by targeting places of significant importance around the city. They basically said that if the British army wouldn't leave Belfast, then they would turn the city into an economical wasteland and bring ordinary life to an end in the city. The IRA's plan was to pack as many explosives as possible into a single hour and set the bombs off all over Belfast. In anticipation of the day, the British army was aware that there was a large number of explosives moving into the city, as they had already seized a number of bombs coming in from the Republic of Ireland at vehicle control checkpoints, but they couldn't stop them all. The bombs themselves were equipped with timers which came from American parking meters and had been posted over to safe houses in Belfast before being brought to bomb assembling areas around the city. Timers and detonators were added to packages containing nitrobenzene which created a number of sizeable bombs. Once the timer was activated, there was no way to turn it off without rendering the bomb useless. So some IRA men ended up having to run away from the scene as quickly as possible to avoid being caught up in the explosion. 
It was a beautiful summer's day on Friday, July 21st, 1972. Many families were out and about in Belfast. As well as that, train and bus stations around the city were jammed with people coming home from their holidays. The first sign that something was amiss happened around lunchtime, when a series of hoax bomb calls were called in. These resulted in some road closures and meant that the police and army would have a difficult time moving around the city for what was to come. The IRA began setting the rest of their plan in motion. In some cases they would steal a parked car and then drive it to a place where the explosives were picked up, and in other cases they would stop cars at random, pointing guns at the drivers and demanding their cars before driving to pick up the bombs. Colin Tennant was on call with the bomb disposal team, who got their first phone call at 1.30 in the afternoon, saying that there were explosives attached to a pylon on Albert Bridge in Belfast. He describes what happens next. While we were dealing with that and trying to clear it up, the radio started really to crackle. Then we started to get these calls in from Brigade saying, here's another incident and another. Just a heads up for the next part, the sources vary when it comes to the exact time that each bomb went off. In this episode, I'll be using the times mentioned on the conflict archive on the internet. Also, there are a lot of bombs, so bear with me over the next part. The first bomb exploded at 9 minutes past 2 in the afternoon on a footbridge in Windsor Park. No one was injured in this bombing. Then, 25 minutes later, another bomb went off at the Brookvale Hotel. This bomb was hidden in a suitcase and luckily the area had been evacuated and there were no casualties. Then, four minutes later, another bomb went off outside Ulster Bank on Limestone Road. This area had not yet been cleared and one woman lost both her legs in the blast and a number of motorists were also injured. Then at 2.52pm, a bomb hidden in a bread van exploded at Botanic Railway Station. The power of the blast was so strong that it blew the leaves off the nearby trees. It also caused huge structural damage to the building, but no serious injuries. One minute later, another bomb went off at Queen Elizabeth Bridge, which damaged the bridge but caused no serious injury. At 3.02pm, a bomb went off outside a group of Protestant houses on Agnes Street in Belfast. There had been no warning placed, but luckily there were no injuries. At the same time, another bomb exploded outside Liverpool Bar in Donegal Quay. There were no serious injuries. Also at 3.02pm, a bomb exploded above the M2 motorway, which did not cause any serious injuries. At 3.03, a bomb exploded at York Street Railway Station. It was hidden in a suitcase and exploded before the station could be emptied. There were a number of people seriously injured, but no deaths. Bernard McTasney described what he saw. It was just chaos. People screaming, people falling to the ground, and glass everywhere. Just chaos. Nobody knew what they were doing. People were on the boat all. I was the same to tell you the truth. Tell you. The shock kept me going. At 3.04, a car bomb then exploded at the gas works at Ormeo Avenue, which did not cause any serious injuries. Apologies for my pronunciation there, I'm not sure how it's pronounced. At 3.05, another bomb went off at Eastwood's garage with no serious injuries. So far there had been no fatalities, but that would change at the Oxford Street bus depot. A car bomb had been planted there, and the IRA called in the warning to the RUC that there was a bomb. Soldier Stephen Cooper was dispatched to check it out. Cooper was just about to celebrate his 19th birthday, and was talking to his sister on the phone when he was ordered to go inspect the bomb threat. He was convinced that it was a hoax bomb threat, as there had been many, many hoax bomb threats made around this time. Here's his sister talking about the last time she spoke with him. I heard someone talking in the background and he asked me to wait a minute because he'd got to talk to someone. And then when he came back to the phone, he said that um, his sergeant needed him. He had to go out on a call, um, on a hoax call, he thought. And um, the last thing I said was to keep your head down. And he said, don't worry, I do. I'm not silly. Stephen, another soldier, and four men who worked for the Ulster Bus Company were looking for the bomb when at 3.10 it exploded, killing them all. At 3.15, a bomb went off at Stewardstown Road but caused no serious injuries. At 3.20, a bomb went off on the Cave Hill Road outside a small group of shops. 
Stephen Parker was a 14-year-old schoolboy who had worked in one of the shops. He had seen the bomb in the back seat of the car and was in the process of running into all the shops to warn people when it exploded, killing him. Two women also died in the blast. 35-year-old Margaret O'Hare, who was a Catholic mother of seven children, died in her car. Her 11-year-old daughter was with her in her car and was badly injured. 65-year-old Bridget Murray was also killed. Here's sisters Jackie and Brenda recalling what happened on the day. From the town, we could hear the signs of bombs going off, but we still kept walking. Yeah, I suppose it's... dad as well, Brenda. Oh, did we? My mum and dad came, were shopping and they came past us in the park and they said, girls, don't be too long because there's a lot of things going off in town. We passed the car, which was outside the shop. The vets. Five of us walked past, and we would have been right up against this car. We walked past it, and then we heard a bomb go off down that way, and we went out to the edge and had a look and down and whatever, it. and then we walked back up past the car. So we and went past... the sweet shop. And then, and then into the chalk box. I just remember this deadly silence, you know, like deafened. I felt really deafened, and I couldn't hear. I felt like I couldn't hear, but I knew that we were screaming and panicking. And I think we held on to each other, and we just screamed at each yeah, other. We, we just didn't really... Think we were going to get out. Well, we, didn't, we genuinely didn't. As, as nine-year-olds, we thought we were going to die in mm-hmm. the shop. At 3.25, another bomb went off on a railway line near Lisburn Road, with no casualties. At the same time, two more bombs went off on Crumlin Road, with no serious injuries. At 3.30, a landmine was detonated on Nuts Corner in West Belfast, just as a bus full of school children was passing by. The driver saw the bomb and swerved and managed to avoid the worst of the blast, and there were no serious injuries. Then at 3.30, a bomb exploded at the Northern Ireland Carriers Depot with no serious injuries. There were also two other bombs set to go off, which were defused by the British military. There was also some other bombs that went off in Derry and Porta Down, but these didn't cause any serious injuries. Back in Belfast, the bombing was finished. In total, 23 bombs were planted. Of that figure, two failed to go off and two were defused. At least 20 of the bombs went off in less than 80 minutes, and most of them went off in a 30-minute period. Nine people were killed and 130 injured, and there was massive amounts of damage done to the transport network of Belfast. There was chaos on the gridlocked streets of the city, In many cases, people would escape the scene of one bomb only to get caught up in one nearby. A bus driver described the state of the city. It was quite awful to see all that. Particularly in Belfast, where usually people were very good. They used to clear areas down quickly, move out of the way. Uh, Not that day. The IRA said that they telephoned warnings of each bomb 30 minutes before each explosion. But with the sheer scale of the attacks, the security forces were completely overstretched and found it hard to tell the difference between real bomb threats and the hoaxes. The recovery and clean-up operation was, and there really are no other words to describe it, horrific. In some cases, bodies could only be identified by a ring or thumbprint or even a tattoo in one case. The body of 14-year-old Stephen Parker, who died while warning people of the bomb, was very difficult to identify. Here's Stephen's father, talking about identifying his son's body at the morgue. My wife waited outside. The body was very badly... His face, uh, head, was very badly, um, you know, um, well uh, disfigured. And, um, but it wasn't possible to recognise him as my son. I felt sorry for the man in the mortuary. He came up and he said, I don't think that's your son. I said, look in the pockets. And, um, of course, he pulled out a box of safety matches. And I looked, of course, Stephen had fooled me two nights before. He was always buying these trick games and so on. They were joke matches? Joke matches, yes. For his bravery on the day, Stephen received an award. The scene at the bus station was like a war zone, and it was very difficult to tell who had lived and who had died. Here's one account from a police officer who had been at Oxford Street bus station. Quote, The first thing that caught my eye was a torso of a human being lying in the middle of the street. It was recognisable as a torso because the clothes had been blown off and you could actually see parts of the human anatomy. One of the victims was a soldier I knew personally. He'd had his arms and legs blown off and some of his body had been blown through the railings. One of the most horrendous memories for me was seeing a head stuck to the wall. 
A couple of days later, we found vertebrae and a rib cage on the roof of a nearby building. The reason we found them was because the seagulls were diving onto it. I've tried to put it at the back of my mind for 25 years. There are other accounts of people given plastic bags and a shovel and asked to walk around and shovel bits of body parts into bags. In some cases, it was impossible to even identify the sex of the bodies, given the extent of the damage. Miraculously, a man named Jack Campbell was leaning on the car that exploded at the bus station and was blown onto the roof of the station from the force of the blast and somehow survived, though he was severely injured. The bombs had permanently damaged his lungs and he passed away from a lung-related illness 25 years after the attacks. There were also accounts of a group of people cheering and yelling every time a bomb went off, showing support for the IRA and their actions on the day. British newspaper, The Guardian, wrote about the events on the day, quote, Such warnings as were given were so vague and imprecise as to be almost useless. For much of the afternoon, Belfast was reduced to near total chaos and panic. Girls and men wept openly, hugging each other for safety in the main streets, as plumes of smoke rose around them and dull thuds echoed from wall to wall. It was impossible for anyone to feel perfectly safe. As each bomb exploded, there were cries of terror from people who thought they had found sanctuary, but in fact were just as exposed as before. A journalist with the Irish newspaper, the Irish Independent, wrote this about the attacks. Quote, In all my years of journalism, which included the worst days of the wartime blitzes, I have never seen scenes as horrible in this city and felt a deep feeling of anger and shame that such deeds were planned and carried out by fellow Irishmen. All Ireland has been shamed by the events of this terrible July afternoon in Belfast. The evening of the attacks, 2,000 British soldiers raided a number of homes of suspected IRA members and a number of people were arrested. Of the 150 IRA members that took part in the bombings on that day, just three were convicted and only one ended up serving a prison term. A number of Catholic civilians were also killed that night by loyalist paramilitaries in response to the attacks. In response to this day, which became known as Bloody Friday, the British Army then ramped up their activity and began Operation Motorman, which was the largest British military operation in decades. It saw 22,000 British soldiers deployed into Northern Ireland, tasked with taking back a number of no-go areas that had been built by nationalist residents and paramilitaries in the city of Derry and in parts of Belfast. The IRA was aware of this operation, and for the most part got out of the areas and decided not to face off against the British Army, as they would have been heavily outnumbered. After the events of the day, the IRA was quick to lay the blame on the police and the army, saying that they hadn't responded to the warning calls they had placed. Keep in mind there were a lot of calls coming in, some of which were hoaxes, so in the chaos of the day it was very difficult for these areas to be evacuated successfully. The IRA released a statement saying, Quote, we accept full responsibility for all explosions in the Belfast area today. In accepting responsibility, we point out that the following organisations were informed of bomb positions at least 30 minutes to one hour before each explosion. The Samaritans, the Public Protection Agency, the Rumour Service and Press. In the case of the Oxford Street explosion, it was heard on the military radio at 10 minutes past two. In the case of the Cave Hill Road explosion, a warning had been given by an independent woman witness at least one hour before the blast. End quote. They went on to say that if the British authorities had acted as they should have, there should not have been any casualties. It was later revealed that police were aware of the bomb at the shops in Cave Hill, and the car sat there for an hour, but they simply couldn't get to it in time. Initially, the IRA believed that Bloody Friday was a resounding success, though there was disagreement. The Sunday after the bombings, some key members of the Belfast IRA met up to talk about the attacks, with some there describing it as, and I quote, a fuck-up and a bollocks, because of the sheer amount of casualties. In later years, Brendan Hughes, who was the officer commanding of the IRA's Belfast Brigade, said of the attacks, quote, I was the operational commander of the Bloody Friday operation, I remember when the bombs started to go off. I was in Leeson Street and I thought, there's too much here. I sort of knew that there was going to be casualties, either because the Brits couldn't handle so many bombs or they would allow some to go off because it suited them to have casualties. 
I feel a bit guilty about it because, as I say, there was no intention to kill anyone that day. I have a fair deal of regret that Bloody Friday took place. A great deal of regret. If I could do it over again, I wouldn't do it. In 2002, the IRA issued the following statement regarding Bloody Friday. Quote, Sunday 21 July marks the 30th anniversary of an IRA operation in Belfast in 1972, which resulted in nine people being killed and many more injured. While it was not our intention to injure and kill non-combatants, the reality is that on this and on a number of other occasions, that was the consequence of our actions. It is therefore appropriate, on the anniversary of this tragic event, that we address all the deaths and injuries of non-combatants caused by us. We offer our sincere apologies and condolences to their families. There have been fatalities amongst combatants on all sides. We also acknowledge the grief and pain of their relatives. The future will not be found in denying collective failures and mistakes or closing minds and hearts to the plight of those who have been hurt. That includes all of the victims of the conflict, combatants and non-combatants. It will not be achieved by creating a hierarchy of victims in which some are deemed more or less worthy than others. The process of conflict resolution requires the equal acknowledgement of the grief and loss of others. On this anniversary, we are endeavouring to fulfil this responsibility to those we have hurt. The IRA is committed unequivocally to the search for freedom, justice and peace in Ireland. We remain totally committed to the peace process and to dealing with the challenges and difficulties which this presents. This includes the acceptance of past mistakes and the hurt and pain we have caused to others. 1972 was a horrific year in the Troubles and Bloody Friday ended up becoming just another day in a year filled with atrocities. Looking back, no one could have possibly known how long the troubles would continue on for, and to what end incidents like this would continue to stoke the flames of the other side. Philip Galt was one of the many people injured on the day, who, to this day, lives in constant pain from the attacks. I'll give the last word to Philip. Thanks, and see you next time. The only question I ever asked was, did they achieve anything by blowing me up? I don't care what they say about the peace process. Did they achieve anything by blowing me up in 72? I was a nine-year-old child. Explain how that achieved a goal, because it's beyond me. Also, just as a reminder that support from this podcast comes directly from you, and you can do so over at my Patreon, which is patreon.com forward slash the Troubles Podcast. There I'll be posting media related to the episodes. I'll also be doing a companion video after I publish every episode. And in that video I'll talk about some aspects of the story that may not have made it into the podcast. I'll also be updating listeners with the news that's happening in Northern Ireland that's related to the Troubles. And there is a lot. So please, if you want to support the podcast, you can do so over at patreon.com forward slash the Troubles podcast. If you prefer to do a once-off donation, you can do that at buymeacoffee.com forward slash Troubles podcast. Alternatively, just tell your friends or leave a review. Everything helps this podcast to grow. So again, thank you so much for all of your support.